And on December the 21st, 1954, the XP-6M Seamaster rolled out of the hangar in secrecy. Like its predecessors, the first impression of the Seamaster was its size. It was almost 50 feet longer than the P-5M Marlin, and even outweighed the big Martin Mars by over 25 tons. Its most striking features were the slender hull design and the large T-tail, which by now was a Martin trademark. Another interesting feature was how the wingtips came to rest on the water. Aviation historian Jay Miller explains. It was uh, designed with what is called uh, anhedral in the wing. And anhedral, instead of the wings uh, being, uh, if you will, angled upward, when you're looking at the airplane from the front, the wings were actually angled down. And in so doing, it was possible to just mount floats permanently on the uh, tips of the P6M's wings. And those floats, when the airplane sat in the water, those floats stabilized the airplane uh, from wingtip to wingtip. The four engines sat over the wings, with the nacelles parallel to the leading edges. At first, Martin engineers had selected the most advanced engines on the drawing board, a turbo ramjet concept being explored by Curtis Wright. Not surprisingly, the design was overly ambitious, and Martin was forced to look for another engine. At the last minute, an Allison J-71 was chosen. The engine put out an underwhelming 13,000 pounds of thrust with afterburner, far less than Martin engineers were looking for. The engines never measured up to the airframe's potential. Its lack of power and reliability would haunt the Martin team until new engines were found. In 1955, the beaching system was still being perfected, as a result, the first prototype spent much of its time in the water. Once finished, the beaching system promised to be a key part of Seamaster operations. The process was fairly straightforward. The aircraft taxied between two pontoons, then was stopped in position by an arresting system. Once in place, the gear automatically locked into the hull using simple flotation pressure. A crew member then opened a hatch and connected hydraulic and electric controls to the gear. Perched on its beaching system, the Seamaster taxied out of the water like a conventional land-based aircraft. For veteran flying boat crews accustomed to the unwieldy process of going ashore, this was a welcome innovation. Early Seamaster taxi tests were carried out on smooth water. Later test runs showed that the hull was sturdy enough to endure six to nine foot swells. The hull shape was also designed to keep spray off the T-tail. Compared to previous flying boats, the Seamaster cockpit sat very low in the water. After his first experience in a Seamaster, one pilot noted that he felt he was peering from the conning tower of a submarine. During the first half of 1955, it became clear that the Seamaster had one serious design flaw. When the pilot lit the afterburner of the two inboard engines, the fuselage behind the engines was getting scorched. After a series of engine run-ups, cracks were found in the aft fuselage. The situation was dire. To avoid serious delays in the test flight program, a quick fix had to be found. Martin decided that, for the time being, the afterburner on the inboard engine should be removed. The fuselage was repaired, and the Seamaster prototype was ready to take to the sky. With only two of the four afterburners available, the Seamaster takeoff run seemed to last forever. Then, with Martin's chief test pilot, George Rodney, at the controls, the new jet flying boat lifted off the water. It was July the 14th, 1955. In theory, the first flight was carried out under a cloak of secrecy. 
Although it must have been difficult to hide the massive seaplane from nearby sailors and fishermen as it roared over Maryland's Chesapeake Bay. Martin test pilot George Rodney reported that the experience was uneventful. Good news for any first flight. The Seamaster was the first large aircraft designed to sustain high subsonic speeds near sea level. When compared to its Air Force contemporaries, the flying boat's performance was striking. By the early 50s, the Strategic Air Command's workhorse bomber was the B-47. At altitude, the B-47's top speed was Mark 0.78. By comparison, the Seamaster flew at Mach 0.89. At low levels, the Seamaster's top speed was 540 miles per hour, again faster than the B-47. Unlike its Air Force counterpart, Navy pilots could use the open sea as the runway. With this flexibility and speed, the Seamaster's potential as a nuclear threat didn't go unnoticed. <laughs> 